I'm uh, Dr. Andy McCoy with the Center for Ministry Studies. I get the very great privilege of welcoming you, you this morning to our lecture by Dr. Olafemi Olaledun entitled Peer Relationship and Sport Commitment. This lecture is part of the Continuum Scholars Faculty Development Program, an interdivisional cohort of pre-tenure faculty members who met last summer to discuss theological perspectives on the vocation of scholarship in the current state of theological reflection and engagement in their research fields. We are so glad that you've joined us today. Each participant with us last summer was asked to craft a vocational biography, and so here is a bit of Femi's. Sport holds a special place for Femi and his family, and some of Femi, Femi's family is with us today. He and his three brothers were all involved in organized sport growing up. Although they all played a wide range of sports, soccer has been the primary shared love. Femi was fortunate enough to play four years at his alma mater, Wabash College, while two of his brothers attended a boarding school with top academics and soccer programs before going on to play, even better than their brother, Division I soccer. His youngest brother has the least experience playing competitive soccer, yet even he demonstrates his love for soccer as a referee. Involvement in organized sport has provided Femi the opportunity to build and share relationships with teammates from various walks of life. Interestingly, observing these relationships would eventually be related to his current occupation, which involves the study of human behavior within the sport context. During Femi's youth sport and collegiate days, he found it important to feel accepted by teammates and found their opinions mattered much. In fact, the relationships Femi shared with teammates contributed to his commitment in sport. And his primary research interests are now in the areas of youth development, self-perceptions, motivation, and peer relationships. Specifically, Femi studies how peer relationships play a role in an athlete's commitment to sport. On a personal note, I'd just like to say how much I've enjoyed getting to know Femi over the past six months, how thankful I am that he's on our team here at Hope College. So will you please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Femi Oluyedun. All right. Thank you, Andy, for that introduction. Um, I would like to give a special thanks uh, to Andy and Dr. Lindsay Root Luna. Uh, on their support this summer it was a lot of fun. I think Greg could attest it was a lot of fun being able to uh, meet this summer, um, discuss you know, our vocations, our scholarship. Uh, it, was a, it was a real um, breath of fresh air uh, for the summer. All right, so I'm really excited to uh, present today. Um, we were trying to organize when we were going to give these presentations, and I was like, I think I can go in the fall, right? I was uh, uh, set maybe to go in the spring, and I was like, I I'd love to go. Uh, in the fall, um, geared up and ready to go. So um, I'm really excited to talk about my work. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my background, uh, then I'll talk about my dissertation work and how that kind of mended into uh, a grant, that uh, a collaborative grant that I worked on with a student uh, this past summer, and then how I, I, can, I see faith fitting into this sport commitment realm. All right, can anybody sing uh, the Canadian National Anthem? I know we're in the water, right? Um, obviously, I'll be talking about commitment today, and this is my first uh, failed joke of the, the talk, but uh, my scalp clearly didn't commit to having hair uh, at all. Um, it's dissipated quite a bit. But, uh, and you'll see in some of these photos, the hair gets less and less over time. Um, but this is me as a very young infant. Uh, I was born in Canada, so my parents both graduated from their undergrads in Nigeria, and then they completed their master's work uh, at Queen's University. So I was born in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, and it's not just me, as uh, Andy alluded to, my family's here. So I got three brothers, two of, two of which are in attendance today. Um, so second in command is uh, Kunle, who's here. Go ahead and raise your hand. <laughs> there, you see, you get the applause. Such a great place. Uh, Jude wasn't able to make it very busy, but uh, my, th my uh, fourth brother there, Kalawale, is also in attendance. <laughs> and my wonderful mother for having <laughs> four boys. <so. laughs> Um, so I show them in pretty much any, to any class I teach. So anytime I start the semester, uh, I kind of show my class like, hey, these are uh, my family members, these are my brothers. 
because they were my my peers growing up. Uh, a lot of the, I think my, my mom even mentioned once, you know, Femi, do you have a lot of friends at school? Because you, you kind of hang out with your brothers all the time. Um, and that's because I felt most comfortable with them, right? And over time, I was able to come out of my shell uh, and make friends, but they were my, my um, peers through blood. We moved from Canada to Wisconsin, lived there for a time, uh, then moved to Indiana, where my family lives now. And uh, I wanted to go, I went to a really small high school, about 24 in my graduating class, but I loved that. Like my Spanish class was three people, okay? So it was like really, really small, but I loved that. Um, and I knew I wanted to go to a small liberal arts school nearby, and Wabash College was that school. So small liberal arts, um, I think now, the graduating classes are from 200 to 250, so again, really small, uh, even compared to Hope. And there I was able to play soccer. It was a ton of fun being able to compete. Again, it's not just me. I wasn't passing myself the ball. Um, I had a lot of teammates um, that I you know, formed really strong relationships with. So a lot of these guys you know, still attending their weddings. Um, we have our group texts. We uh, interact a lot. And a lot of my, I guess, experiences while competing in sport in college or what informed what I did for my dissertation work. So um, really love being able to, I remember a lot of moments, you know, Stu and I talked about moments. Moments that I remember are the bus drives to and from a game, um, pre-game meals, post-game meals. Um, I used to go to the library all the time just to talk. <laughs> like I'd study some, <laughs> but I was usually there to like meet these guys and talk. Uh, so these relationships, these social interactions were really important to me, um, and I knew I'd want to study it in some way. Uh, ironically, my junior year, an uh, individual named Dr. Chris Carr came to Wabash College and um, he said, I do this thing called sports psychology. And I was like, whoa, what is that? Right? I was a psychology major and I obviously played uh, sports. And this, this kind of mending between sport and psychology was a really cool thing to me and I knew I wanted to, to pursue it. So I applied to Purdue University. So again, pretty close to home uh, where my advisor, my then advisor was. And uh, I got in, I got accepted. And then he let me know maybe a few days later, um, I'm actually going to be the department chair at Michigan State University. Uh, and so he said, would you like to follow me? I thought about it for like exactly one minute. I was like, yes, <laughs> I will follow you. Um, and so I followed him to Michigan State University, um, where I completed my master's and my PhD. Uh, my master's thesis was focused on children diagnosed with, their, with ADHD um, and to what extent they overestimate their abilities related to sport. Right? So there's actually been a lot of work on children diagnosed with ADHD and to what extent they overestimate their abilities in other achievement domains, such as academics, socially, behaviorally. But nobody had examined sport, and I knew I wanted to, to examine that. And I, I had a pretty uh, sincere interest in uh, those non-typically developing uh, populations. So that was a, a fun and informative project. It was a lot of work, taught me a lot of lessons. <laughs> it took a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but uh, it taught me a lot of good things. And then for my PhD, uh, which I'll be talking about today, I focused on peer relationships and sport commitment. So I knew I wanted to do something a little bit more within the, the area of, of sports psychology because uh, my master's was kind of, it was very interdisciplinary, um, but I wanted something to be kind of a, a, an out and out sports psychology study. And so I wanted to focus on things I love to do, observe behavior, and I love to talk about commitment. I taught a various courses at Michigan State University, so, um, and I'll actually give a story here quick as, as to how I actually came to Hope for the first time. But I taught the equivalent of health dynamics uh, at uh, MSU. I taught a sports psychology course, which is pretty much the exact same here, motor development course. Uh, so it was really cool being able to not only learn from you know, top uh, researchers in the field, but also being able to teach. And that's where I fell in love with, with teaching. Again, it's not just me. I had a huge support system. You can see some photos here of uh, those that, some of my colleagues that are in my lab, uh, as well as we played a lot of IM sports. So again, like I've uh, mentioned before, sport was a way for me to develop friendships. It was kind of the easiest way for me to, to do so. And so we played all sorts of IM sports, soccer, basketball you see here, ultimate frisbee, volleyball. We weren't great at all of them, but we, we definitely, uh, we bonded uh, over that time. So I really enjoyed uh, grad school and the people I was able to meet. So now I'm an assistant professor uh, of kinesiology at Hope College um, and an interesting story of how I came here the first time. So this room is a room that I was in in 2012 for what's called MSEPS. It's a sports psychology conference and I remember seeing Scott because uh, you gave a talk. I, <laughs> I don't remember you being here. Yeah, so he doesn't remember. I was 
I was very quiet, very, very quiet in the back. Um, and there was a lot of snow because everybody kept talking about snow melt. And I was like, there's plenty of snow on the ground. <laughs> so maybe it's not down. But uh, it was about two feet of snow. Um, but I actually came here first um, to collect data. So for my dissertation, I was collecting data. I reached out to Dr. North Ice and I said, hey, could I collect data with your uh, cross-country team? He said, sure, come on down. I met him at the Dow and he said, uh, yeah, so what do you teach at MSU or what do you do at MSU? And I was like, oh, I teach a range of courses. I kind of explained the courses that I taught. And he goes, hmm, that's pretty interesting. Let me get Dr. Brummels over here. Maybe you could talk with him just for you know, a couple of minutes. That could be useful while the, the athletes are completing their survey. I said, sure. So I met Dr. Brummels, talked to him for about uh, five minutes. And uh, I talked, yeah, talked with him for about five minutes. And then he <laughs> got Scott, <laughs> Dr. Vanderstoop, to come over and talk to, to Scott for a little bit. So uh, my first day here, I didn't even expect to you know, meet really anybody. Um, but I basically had like a pre-job talk <laughs> for that. And so I was able to visit a few times after that um, and thankfully was able to land a position here. So I teach a range of courses here, um, which allows me to be in contact with a lot of students, which is awesome. Um, I teach a health dynamics course, uh, research methods this semester, uh, sports psychology and, and motor development, like I mentioned before, um, a writing and exercise science course. So I love it because my, my peers, in a sense, are not only my colleagues, but my students, right? Because I'm around them all the time. And uh, these are some photos of, of some of the students I've worked with more recently, um, whether it be in research or within the classroom. So some of, some of these photos here are from our metabolism um, talks. Uh, Core, he won exercise science major of the year. Um, and then I, this is my lab group. We went bowling uh, as a kind of a thank you from me to them uh, for doing some hard work over the summer, this past summer on research. So. Um, I've really enjoyed my time at Hope College, and obviously I hope to be here for, for a long time. Okay, so now we can kind of transition into some of the specifics um, that I received my master's and PhD in. The first thing I want to do is define sport commitment. Uh, it does take, it, it's had a lot of changes over the decades, which I think is cool. I think that's a good thing about um, some of the sports psychology research is that people are continuing to, to push the envelope and make sure that what we're um, trying to observe or trying to examine uh, is pertinent stuff. So sport and exercise psychology researchers uh, have focused on understanding some factors that can contribute to and detract from quality sport experiences. And that's what I'm really interested in is what are the experiences of athletes um, as they engage in their sport. One of those factors is social influence. Um, peers can bolster or subvert these sport experiences as you might imagine. Um, and it's important to note that when I talk about peers, it can be co collegiate athletes, adolescent athletes, right? Um, and as you might imagine, athletes kind of develop a, in terms of sources of competence, so to what extent they feel like they're competent in their sport, they get that from their parents to begin with. So until they're around 12, they look to their parents to be like, okay, am I good at this sport? Yes or no? And then you get to about 13, 14, and it transitions to peers. Now peers are the ones that you're around a ton of the time. Their opinions matter quite a bit. And so, um, when we talk about you know, bolstering or subverting sport experiences, peers can play a, a really salient role in how uh, some of these athletes are motivated. Um, in terms of sport participation motives, fun and enjoyment is usually listed as the, the top one. Um, skill development and fitness and appearance. So a lot of times people are engaged in sport because they want to feel competent, develop some skills. Fitness and appearance are related to that, right, in terms of fitness. But the most important one that I want to stress is social acceptance and affiliation, right? That's what I'm, I'm interested in. I'm, I consider my um, occupation kind of, I'm looking at social relationships within the sport context, and my laboratory are fields, courts, ice rinks, swimming pools, right? That's, those are my laboratories where I'm trying to observe behavior. Um, and so this social acceptance and affiliation to me is really interesting because I, I could remember how important it was for me to feel like I fit in with my teammates, my peers. And so a lot of the work you'll see uh, here coming up is related to uh, this social acceptance and affiliation piece. So what are peers, right? I'm assuming most of you probably have an idea, a rough idea of what peers are. Um, but they're same to near age um, individuals who have equal standing with class and rank, right? Another wrinkle that's important to, di to distinguish with, within the sport context is that uh, you could also have a peer who is similar in athletic ability. So like if I play on the, if I'm 15 and I play on the U18 soccer team, I'm still a peer to those individuals even though I'm not the same age as them, right? Because I share 
a similar athletic ability. Uh, so those are some important things to know about um, peers. Now, when we think of peer relationships, it's important to note that, again, they are motivationally salient. This is the work that uh, my advisor, um, and along with his advisor, have really tried to, to push out there is, you know, we've discussed a lot about maybe adult influence on uh, athletes, so parents, coaches, teachers, professors, and their influence that they have. And so there's a, a majority of the literature is on that. Um, we've tried to now move towards to what extent do peers, right, um, motivate, each other's in motivate each other in different ways, right? We know that they're motivationally salient, so looking at them in particular is, is another route to observe. So we have these peer constructs. Uh, they were put together by Smith and McDonough uh, in 2008. And essentially what they do is they allow us to examine some of the relationships that they may share with other outcomes, right, such as sport commitment. So friendship quality, when we think of friendship quality, generally how we measure this is we, identify, we have an athlete identify their closest friend on the team, and then we ask them a set of questions related to um, that friendship. Peer acceptance is to what extent you feel accepted by your teammates, right? So again, a self-report. And pressure motivation is a, is a unique one. It's to what extent I want to feel like I have to fit in, right? So it's the impression or the motivation to um, try to fit in, right? So for example, the way I might impression manage when I'm having a meeting with Dr. Vanderstoop might be different than what I, how I'm trying to manage when I'm having a meeting with Dr. Ryder, right? Um, there's different, different elements to that relation, those relationships, and so the impression motivation might change a little bit there. And for athletes, it's, it's particularly interesting because athletes often impression, are often highly impression, often has, have high impression motivation, right? Um, think about the venues that they compete in, right? Literally, there are stands in which we view their um, athletic um, behaviors, right? But they're also expected to be standouts in the classroom, standouts family-wise, standouts um, obviously on the courts or fields, right? So we generally see that they uh, report higher levels of impression motivation. So that's another important thing that I'll, I'll discuss within this talk. Okay, so we have the original sport commitment model, and this is highly theoretical, but I wanted to make sure that we could, could see this model. It's important to note that even though you see arrows, it's not causal, right? So it's all correlational. Um, so what we're seeing here with the solid arrows is a positive association between that source, right, and sport commitment. And the dotted arrow is a negative association. Right? And a negative association just means, so for example, other priorities would mean that you would have other priorities that take precedent than the sport you might be playing. And so we would expect a negative association there. Um, what's interesting about this original sport commitment model, right? and the sport commitment, I didn't say the definition, it's the psychological desire and resolve to remain in sport over time. What's interesting about this is it only has one level of sport commitment. right? And it assumes that if you are committed to sport, it's because you want it to be committed to sport. Okay? And that's an important distinction because over time we realized, you know what, am I committed to things that I always want to be committed to? Probably not, right? And so um, re researchers decided to take another look at this and kind of identify maybe a different model that we can use, right? So uh, the original sport commitment model was created in the early 90s, and more recently we've, we've developed what's called the um, updated sport commitment model that has two forms. So first we have our want to, so the desire to remain in sport over time, and a want to type of commitment. This is kind of linked with intrinsic motivation uh, to compete in sport. You can see some photos here. So this photo over here is a picture of my brothers on their boarding school team. Uh, really tight, uh, close, uh, tight-knit tight tight group. So I would visit every once in a while and I'd see my brother Kunle and my brother Jide um, you know, compete and, and be around their friends, and it was clear that they were like, <laughs> they were like brothers, right? Um, you can see my, me and my teammates here, right? We assume that if you have these formative relationships or friendships, it's gonna enhance your uh, enthusiastic commitment, okay? Now, we also have constrained commitment, right? We have a have to, I feel like I have to uh, uh, be committed. So perceptions of obligation to persist in sport over time. My brothers, like I said before, both played, they're much better than me, so they both played collegiately. Um, and I've, I've had discussions with them where I said, oh, you know, like, how's it going? They're like, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of work. It can sometimes feel like a job, right? Um, and, you know, reasons that they may have stayed in sport is because they didn't want to let their teammates down. They were on scholarship, right? So it's a little bit different of a dynamic than our want to type of commitment. Here, you're staying in sport, and that's a good thing, but it's a more have to type of relationship. And we prefer the enthusiastic. 
So these things can kind of coalesce at the same time. Okay, so now we have the updated support commitment model. You can see it's more robust. Uh, there's two additional sources, social support and desire to excel. But where I want to point your attention to is the kind of two-pronged or two-form of support commitment here, enthusiastic and constrained. And so what, what this represents is that we now are maybe accounting for more of what sport commitment truly is, not just a want to type of commitment, but there are some cases in which we feel like we have to be committed uh, to remain in sport. So this kind of takes me to what I focused on for my dissertation, which is the associations among dimensions of friendship quality and sport commitment. You'll hear me say predict a lot. Again, this is just association, so it's not causal in any way. I want to I be sure to stress that. So when we think of friendships, we know that close friendships can have a lot of benefits. So for example, it can, it can enhance self-esteem, it can buffer loneliness uh, and stress, and uh, it can be linked to companionship and emotional support. So these are all things that, you know, if we're in a context, whether it's sport, work, family, these are all things that we'd want to have, right? Um, and so what's, what's interesting about friendship quality within the sport domain is these are people that, again, you might have a lot of contact hours with. And so it's important that you have this sense of friendship on the team, right? It's important to have a close friend on the team, someone you can depend on, someone that you can, can go to that can, you know, hype you up. That's important with friends. Um, so this is, this is one aspect of peer relationships. Another is the broader peer group. So we have, for example, peer acceptance and impression motivation, which we've touched on before. These are linked to global self-worth positive and negative emotion, and then also motivational processes, right? So to what extent I feel like I'm accepted by my peers, to what extent um, I feel like I have to create an image that allows me to fit in with my peers, with my coaches, with those around me, uh, is important. So these three constructs, peer constructs, are important because they allow us to actually examine the relationships between them and sport commitment. Okay? So again, highly theoretical, but um, I think some of the, the examples uh, can, be, can be useful as I go through. So what is friendship quality? Uh, interestingly enough, my advisor is the one that developed this scale. Um, and this scale has six dimensions. Five of them represent friendship quality. So you can see there's self-esteem enhancement and supportiveness, loyalty and intimacy, uh, things in common, right? How much things in common do you have with your friend? companionship and pleasant play, and then conflict resolution. So if there is conflict, which there can be within a friendship, can you resolve that conflict? Very important. Fr friendship quality, um, or sorry, negative friendship quality is linked to friendship conflict, right? So that's its kind of own distinct. When we talk about negative friendship quality, it's kind of one construct, which is conflict. Uh, this is my buddy here. He's actually, uh, he lives in Toronto. And uh, he and I, again, we have been friends since... You know, we started college in 2008, um, talk a lot. So a lot of the kind of, th when I was doing this project, I was often thinking back to like, oh, so what's my friendship quality with my, <laughs> with my friend Tommy? And uh, where did I have conflict with friends, right? And so it's kind of, there's a lot of fun work to do. Okay, so in terms of the literature that was already out there, my advisor and his advisor actually did a study that looked at tennis players in particular, and to what extent friendship quality could predict sport commitment, okay? Uh, they specifically found that uh, positive dimensions of friendship quality positively predicted sport commitment and enjoyment. Okay? So what you, what you notice here is they added this enjoyment piece right, to the sport commitment piece, and that helped account for more of the variance. Right? So they were able to find pretty significant findings, um, and I thought to myself, that's interesting, but I would like to look at sport commitment on its own right, as a construct. Uh, instead of kind of muddying the waters with sport enjoyment, which um, often shares a lot of variance with, with uh, enthusiastic commitment. So um, now that we have the two forms of sport commitment, I figured there might, this might provide a more nuanced explanation of how your peers can tie to sport commitment. So the primary purpose of my study was to examine the dimensions of sport friendship quality as predictors of enthusiastic and constrained commitment. And then the secondary purpose uh, of my study was to examine a span of peer constructs. So now, you know, I showed kind of a friendship quality, peer acceptance, impression motivation, showed all that. Now we're looking at how all of those peer constructs might predict uh, someone's sport commitment uh, in terms of enthusiastic and constrained forms. I had a couple of hypotheses linked to these. So my hypothesis one was linked to my primary purpose. Um, 
it was that positive friendship quality would positively predict enthusiastic commitment. So you can see that signified by the arrow. So positive friendship quality and positive enthusiastic commitment, we expect those to have a positive relationship. My secondary hypothesis was linked to uh, my primary purpose uh, again. So here we expect that negative friendship uh, quality or conflict, right, would be linked to con more constrained commitment. So if I have more conflict within my relationships, maybe I'm going to have a more constrained relationship with commitment uh, in my sport context. And then my third hypothesis was linked, again, to that range or span of peer constructs. So friendship quality, peer acceptance, and impression motivation. I wanted to see if they could account for um, uh, predicting sport commitment above and beyond the friendship quality dimensions. Right? Um, and this is an important approach because we want to know, you know, if we provide a span of peer constructs, does it provide a better picture? Because right? uh, sometimes if you're looking at one construct to another, it's not always going to provide um, a, the greatest picture in terms of that relationship. So these are some of the measures I use. So I got some demographic information. Uh, we utilize the friendship quality scale. It's a 22 item scale where again, they identified their closest friend on the team and then uh, respond to uh, some questions on the item uh, questionnaire. Peer acceptance, again, that has to do with social, your social acceptance on the team. Um, it's actually only a five item scale and it's a, it's a highly used scale in the field, uh, spe especially within the uh, uh, physical domain. Impression motivation, again, to what extent do I feel like I need to manage my behavior to fit in? Um, this is a 15 item scale, so you, it's a very unique scale in that there's a, a prompt that they read and then they have a line zero to 100, uh, it's, and it's actually you know, 100 milliliters, and they make a line on that, that line to um, either agree or disagree with the, with the statement. So it's interesting because you have to go back in terms of you know, entering the data. You have to go back, measure it with a, <laughs> with a ruler, each one. So 15 items times however many uh, participants is a lot of time. <laughs> um, and then sport commitment. So this is an 11 item scale. We had five items for enthusiastic commitment, six for constrained. Uh, commitment. So those are our measures. Um, the, the average age was around 20. 62% um, female, so predominantly female. Um, 198 uh, athletes after were in the final analyses. And then it was predominantly white um, uh, sample. So for those of you that might be familiar with this statistical technique, it's called a canonical correlation. Um, if you know, if you're familiar with the correlation, it's uh, to what extent one variable shares a relationship with another variable, right? But here, I'm looking at it in a multivariate sense. So I have more than one dependent variable, right? So uh, I'm looking at enthusiastic and constrained commitment as my dependent variables, and then all of the friendship dimensions as my uh, independent variable. And so there's a, there's a lot going on with that. And so I tried to, I, I didn't want to have all my stats up here. I figured it would be better to show a schematic. But what you can see here is I only found partial support for my primary hypothesis. Again, that was looking at to what extent friendship quality could predict sport commitment. So the friendship dimensions predicted sport commitment, but not in theoretically <laughs> consistent directions. It's actually the opposite, <laughs> okay? Um, so for example, we found support for high, our, our second hy hypothesis, which said that uh, you know, higher conflict is gonna predict higher constrained commitment. But what you can see on the bottom is when, we, when I did my canonical correlation, the predominant root between enthusiastic and, and constrained commitment was uh, constrained commitment. So basically, if you looked at the friendship dimensions, the best explanatory root was constrained commitment, ironically. And higher loyalty and intimacy and higher conflict were related to greater constrained commitment, while less conflict or resolution was related to constrained commitment. So again, it's not in the direction I expected. I saw this and I was like, great. <laughs> this is going to be fun to defend. Now, our, third, our secondary purpose um, did provide support. So we did see that uh, the addition of peer acceptance and impression motivation did now help us basically have a better picture of how friendship quality worked. So you can see some of the dimensions of friendship quality, so self-esteem enhancement, loyalty and intimacy, things in common, uh, companionship and pleasant play. If we had greater levels of that, we had greater levels of enthusiastic committed, uh, commitment. Um, same with impression motivation, so someone had a greater uh, impression motivation, they had a greater um, enthusiastic commitment. Then on the constrained side, we see that greater conflict, like we expected, would be linked to greater constrained commitment. And then if we had less things in common, we were less able to um, come to resolutions in terms of conflict with our friend. And if we felt less socially accepted by our peers, that was also related to constrained commitment. So 
it created a much better picture. We kind of had a better idea of <laughs> what was going on. So what this suggested is that there might be a social tapestry of peer contracts that are necessary to identify some of these um, friendship quality dimensions, links with sport commitment. In other words, we might need that span of peer constructs to actually be able to see, to better see, how friendship quality relates to sport commitment. Um, so this updated sport commitment model, it did help us provide a more nuanced understanding of how peers are important to sport commitment. Um, and it, it suggests that when we look at sport commitment, we may want to look at a range right, or a span of peer constructs instead of trying to make one-to-one -one comparisons. Because it can be tough, again, to account for enough variance to see uh, those relationships play out. Some limitations, so we didn't have a very representative sample, um, and that was something that I knew I wanted to try to address going forward. It was cross-sectional in nature. What I think is gonna be interesting in my time here at Hope is to be able to cultivate relationships with coaches over time in the Holland area, um, in the Zealand area, even in the East Lansing area, right where I was for a time, uh, so that I can maybe do some more longitudinal studies. That's a realistic uh, thing that I might be able to do. I referee a ton, and so I do know these coaches. I see these coaches often, so it would be great to be able to um, see if I can work with their teams over time. Um, I did collect this data uh, during COVID-19, so like right when I was ready to <laughs> propose my dissertation, COVID-19 happened. So um, the timing of the data collection was not ideal. Um, also, they had to rely on recall, right? Because their seasons were effectively canceled and I was reaching out to them after their seasons were canceled. So they had to kind of think back, what is my friendship like with uh, such and such person? Uh, to what extent do I impression manage? So on and so forth. So that was a, that was a, a limitation. And one thing that I thought of was, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic forced people to interact in using digital means, right? And so to what extent can we now look at interaction through technology? Our, our athletes aren't just interacting with each other physically, right, uh, in person. They're also interacting through technology, whether that's group text, Snapchat, so on and so forth, right? So that's a kind of a future direction that we, we figured would be a cool next step. So this brings us to uh, a study I did here at uh, Hope College this summer, uh, looking at the associations among, again, peer relationships, social interactions or social media, and sport commitment. I worked with uh, Julia Dawson. She's actually abroad right now in London, uh, but she was a tremendous um, student to work with. And we wanted to address this kind of gap in the literature in terms of maybe social media use um, and how that plays a role in terms of social interactions that we see amongst our athletes. So what we did is we wanted to look at the influence of media. So we looked at uh, to what extent, we know that peers play a vital role in shaping the sport experiences of their uh, fellow peers. We know that quality peer relationships can foster sport participation, right, if it's in a, an adaptive uh, way. And so we what we wanted to do was look at social media, another means of interacting with our peers. So we looked at teens, 90% uh, of teens aged 13 to 17 use social media in some way, right, which is an astounding number. 51% um, report using social media daily. So we know that, th that they're using these devices or means to interact and it's kind of outside of the sport context. A lot of the work I've done is, you know, what do the relationships look like when they're at practice or at games? But now we know they use social media. That's another area that we can uh, examine. So the purpose of this study was uh, twofold, to examine peer relationship construct as predictors of sport commitment, try to kind of replicate some of the work that we did for my dissertation, and then to explore the role of social media use and satisfaction um, as predictors of sport commitment. So to what extent now, if we roll in social media use as another sphere of social interaction, what role does that play? Now, interestingly, there's not been a ton of work on social media in sport. There's really not a ton of work on it. You actually have to go to relationship research to provide yourself with some ideas of how to actually, you know, identify a measure that's gonna work um, to examine uh, social media use. So a lot of these measures you can see are the same that I used in my dissertation, except that bottom one. So uh, ironically, my uh, advisor uh, gave me some, some feedback on what measure might work. And uh, we looked, we utilized the adapted relationship scale. This was for relation, like intimate relationships. And so I had to adapt it for, <laughs> for um, adolescents, obviously. So this is an ongoing study, still collecting data for this study, so we don't have any finalized results. But our age range is 13 to 19. Uh, we were shooting for about 250 participants. 
uh, and we, we specified it uh, come from soccer uh, athletes. Again, that's my, my best link. That's what I played growing up. I know most coaches in that context. Um, and a lot of the literature that looks at um, peer motivation among adolescents does look at the sport of soccer. So we wanted to do that. So it's had me driving all over the place. I've driven to um, Indianapolis to collect data, Livonia, um, Grand Ledge, here in town. So I worked with some Holland teams here. Um, but it's a lot of fun being able to collect data in person <laughs> rather than just sending out a link and hoping and, and, and praying that people uh, complete the, the link. So we don't have any finalized data with this, but I'm excited uh, to, one, work with a student. She was tremendous uh, and instrumental. She was able to, to follow me for uh, some of the data collection um, that we did. And it was, it was really cool to be able to talk to her about you know, life, really, right? How is her life going? How is she doing in school? Um, I, that's what I'm here for at Hope College is to not just teach, right, to, to hear myself talk, but uh, I want to learn about my students and, and what's going on in their lives, right? And she, she was also a soccer player, so she was able to link us with a lot of teams, which was great. So we've talked about all of these constructs, right? It's highly theoretical. And now we want to get to a more practical, like what's the practicality of the work? And I think that one thing I've always wondered is what is the role that faith plays when we're thinking about staying in sport, sport experiences, right, among youth. These are just some quotes that I pulled. So Tim Howard um, was a goalkeeper for the United States um, national team. He quotes, this most, the most important thing in my life is Christ. He is more important to me than winning or losing or whether I'm playing or not. Everything else is just a bonus. Uh, we have Allison Felix. My focus, is in, my focus in every race is to bring God the glory. Uh, and then we have Russell Wilson. Uh, win or lose, it's about him for me. It doesn't matter the ups and downs, the good and the bad. Just keep him first, right? So what you can tell from these quotes is it's not just, we can look at all these sources and try to see where things link in terms of correlations. But this is something that I think we need to address within the literature. Nobody has touched it. Nobody's even come close to discussing faith in terms of to what extent it, it plays a role in uh, adolescence or collegiate athlete sporting experiences. And so I think that uh, being a, a faculty member here at Hope College and having um, colleagues that work um, in, in faith, right, and looking and researching faith, we're at, a, we're at a, a crossroads now where we can look into this and examine some of this work. Um, so for example, um, my first year I worked on a project with Dr. Ryder and Dr. Uh, Charlotte Whitley and basically was looking at whether team versus individual sport plays a role in predicting sport commitment. And we added one of her measures, flourishing. And it actually helped mediate the relationship between team and individual sport and sport commitment. So that's a really cool finding that I think we can continue to, to explore because I think this is a piece that's it's really missing. Right? We, again, we can have all these sources. We can keep it incredibly theoretical. But at the end of the day, what's something practical that uh, somebody here at Hope College or maybe the high school that's Christian affiliated can, can utilize and tell their players like, hey, um, if you, like faith is important. And if faith is important to you, maybe it's going to be something that uh, is adaptive for you over time. I'd like to acknowledge some individuals, so uh, my, my research students, so Julia Dawson, Ryan Flynn, Michaela KK, she goes by KK, Roman, uh, and Mariah Zelma. It was really fun being able to, to hang out with them over the summer uh, and, and start some research projects. I'd like to thank the participants that helped out in um, providing data, supportive faculty. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Lindsay Root Luna and Dr. Uh, Andy McCoy. It's been tremendous. Again, the Continuum Scholars Program was a breath of fresh air. Um, it was interesting because it was like right after we, we finished the semester and boom, right into this, this next phase. And I was like, man, I'm pretty tired. Am I going to be able to do this? No, it was a lot of fun, right? And so I think all of us can attest, right, Greg and, and everybody that was involved with that. It was a lot of fun. And then lastly, family and friends. Um, could not do it without you guys. Um, it's really fun to be able to, to, to be involved here at Hope College, but also to be able to say, hey, these are the things I do day in and day out. These are the people that I spend a lot of my time with when I'm not here. Uh, so it's, it's a truly a blessing. So, thank you. Okay, friends, we've got some moments here uh, to uh, ask some questions of Dr. Oloyedu, if you, if you have any, and I certainly hope that you do, or I'll call on you. <laughs> yes, Dr. Ryder. Thanks. Mm. 
Absolutely. So there's kind of different tiers of sports psychology. So the tier I was most interested in coming out of undergrad was the applied side, right? Where you're going to work with athletes one-on-one, -on -one, um, see if you can improve their performance through different skills. Then I kind of got interested in the research side, right? That's why my talk was very or highly theoretical. Um, and then the, the, the last side is kind of the teaching side. So I see myself as kind of a teacher, educator within sports psychology. And, you know, your question is in relation to basically, basically social cohesion. Uh, I talked at a local high school recently on how to basically get a stronger cohesive group, right? So there's a lot of things that are involved in being a, a strong group because there's things that are going to detract from that. Rewards, right? Preseason polls, right? Um, there's a lot of individual elements of sport that are going to pull away from you know, a team getting to be socially cohesive, but there's a lot of elements within sports psychology that, that can help us address that. So you know, sometimes I might go and work with a team where I say, okay, I need you to do this particular skill as a team, right? And if you can, if I put them in very specified groups, there's something called social loafing, which is if you put too many people in a group, <laughs> you actually, you, you lose a lot of, um, if, if somebody doesn't have indispensability, they put in less effort, right? So I'll tell them, okay, I'm gonna put you in groups of four, I'm gonna give you this task, and I'm, I'm expecting them for the first couple of times to fail, right? And then I add wrinkles to the task uh, to ensure that I'm seeing, they can see how they're developing and, and improving as a group. So a lot of my training, Although on the research side, um, I, I did get training on the applied side. And what's nice about that is I can go and talk to these groups, especially if they're within my sport, right? For soccer, that's the one I gave the talk on. And um, it was a great uh, experience because I was able to say, hey, for pregame routines, imagery might be something you want to take advantage of, right? So even for this talk today, I knew it was going to be in this room. <laughs> I knew roughly who was going to be here and who wasn't. People did a great job of letting me know. <laughs> and uh, so I could kind of visualize how am I going to feel when I'm presenting? What's it going to feel like, right? Even when I practice, I'm going to practice with this uh, sport coach. So I've, I've thought of a lot of things in terms of, um, you know, the applied side of sports psychology. So anytime a coach asks me, I try to give them realistic feedback on what might work. And then I, you know, provide my services if, if they request it. Yes, please. Um, you didn't, but you, in your answer just now, you mm -hmm. Yes. To win. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a big piece of, of sport commitment. Yes. And, and I thought more of it when you put up your slide with respect to faith. Okay. Because some of the quotes said, it doesn't matter if I win or lose, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about God and my faith. Yes. And, and so can you speak to the competitive nature of it? Yeah, so uh, a big reason, so when I look at my literature um, and my field, I'm looking at, I'm focused on sport experiences. So um, things that are directly laid, related to performance, I don't have a lot of, there's not a lot of literature that does well in explaining that. So for example, you'll notice that there was nothing in my talk today that said, you know, even if you become a socially cohesive group, that directly relates to performance. We can't necessarily say that, right? There might be associations that are linked, but we can't have that direct link. I think when it comes to competitiveness, a big reason I didn't add it into my um, my research is the scale itself do, is, isn't all that great, right? So there's a, there's a couple of things in sport where, for example, athletic identity. That's, that scale is pretty rough. It doesn't do a great job of predicting someone's athletic identity. And so a lot of times researchers will leave it out because they're like, well, if it's going to mess up my results, I'm going to leave it out. So I think with competitiveness, you know, we know it plays a role. What I try to do is identify my specific interests in the peer relationship side and the sport commitment side. And then maybe we can, over time, try to think of different ways to actually measure uh, competition in sport. Because the measures just aren't that, everybody rates themselves incredibly high, basically, right? You get a ceiling effect. Like, are you competitive? Yeah, I'm competitive. So um, you get a little bit of social desirability there. So you're talking about on the predictive side. Yes. Uh, we do, we, I'd argue that a majority of researchers do not. I think what we try to do is um, create links. So if I have strong friendships on a team, I'm more likely to stay on the team. I'm more likely to have enthusiastic commitment for that team. 
And we know that there's literature that suggests that if you have a strong, cohesive group, that generally links to better performance, right? You're willing to go above and beyond for your teammates. So yeah, that outcome side of, of looking at performance is always tough to, to examine. So a lot of our work is an experimental in nature. That's why I wanted to kind of stress that a lot of this is correlational. There's not a lot of causality uh, here. Um, but we are getting closer to trying to predict causality with different types of experimental techniques. But again, it's focused on physical activity motivation, right? Like how can we get people to actually um, adopt a new behavior in terms of being uh, exercising more and things like that. But yeah, that's, I think that's one thing that uh, within sports psychology that we need to get better with, right? Practicality side, right? And uh, more measures that are directly predicting things like performance. Yeah, Eva. Yeah. Yeah, I, and that's a great point. And I didn't measure competence, and I should have, <laughs> right? Like, I think that uh, when we look at competence, we know that a lot of people are going to be committed to things they're good at, right? So if I'm good at something, I'm more likely than to be committed to that activity. And I, and I didn't measure competence. Um, in hindsight, I, th I wish I would have. Um, confidence, peer acceptance, you know, I think I was focused on those peer constructs. Um, and I wanted to keep my measure relatively short enough so that they'd finish it. But I think competence is it's a critical one, right? And I think that's one that we can look at going forward and make sure that we add it and, and have it for the future because it's a critical piece. Lindsay? Yeah, I have two, two questions. Mm -hmm. One is about the peer conflict. So mm -hmm. um, does it matter what the conflict is about? Or have, have you gotten far, have folks gotten far, not just you, but like have yeah. folks gotten far enough to think about that? So that's conflict on the team with things outside. Oh, okay. I, I see. So, so for the conflict, it's specific to that close friend. So, so they list that close friend, and then it's with the close friend in terms of the conflict. We haven't got to a point where we kind of really outline what that conflict is like, yeah. right? What we do examine is the differences in how people handle conflict between maybe an adolescent and a, a collegiate athlete, right? So younger athletes, if there's any presence of conflict, they struggle to even identify that person as their friend, right? As for when, they're, when people are adults, they do a much better job with uh, conflict resolution. And so they have a more, you know, it's like, I may not agree with you on who the best soccer player is, but, you know, we could still be friends. Right. Um, well, I might be mad at you about something that happened in an academic context, but we're still, yes, we're on the field. We're still in the field. We're making it happen. Yes. You know? But yeah, we don't have a ton of, of what the conflict looks like, just that the presence or absence of it. Yeah. Yes. And if you think that, what, what do you think about do you potentially those two things playing a role? I think it plays a major role. So if we were to look at the faith piece, I think we'd really want to look at some of these social support provisions um, and how socially cohesive some of these groups or teams are. Because that's going to play a huge role as to, to, to what extent they're adopting team, um, you know, things that teams are trying to, to adopt as, for, you know, coaches trying to stress for their team. So. Uh, that's why I looked at, so social support provisions are actually somewhat linked with friendship quality, so that's why I wanted to look at that. But as far as the faith piece, I think that's going to be the first step, is to what extent do people feel supported on their team, and then, you know, if you have high support, now can a coach come in and say, hey, we're going to kind of adopt this approach to how we, you know, um, see life in general, and we'd like to see if there's links there. Yeah. Time for maybe one more. Absolutely, Femi's mother. Oh boy. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question. Would you restate the question just sure. a little bit? Thank you. Uh, so um, she asked, to what extent, like, how can I see faith? How can coaches utilize faith in addressing uh, adolescents, college athletes, um, and for me in particular, uh, kind of my time in my adolescence, um, my PhD program, my time at Hope College, how can faith play a role? Um, you know, I think for me in, in particular, I'll speak to, about myself first. Uh, my mom is an incredibly religious person. She, anytime I talk with her, I talk with her usually every day after our, on my drive home. My drive home is about 45 minutes, so uh, I get to talk to her a lot. And um, I think her example is the, best, is the best thing for me, has been the best thing for me. Um, ensuring that I'm, I'm being sincere in my faith. And it, it, was, it, was, it was really necessary through my PhD program. It was a tough, um, especially ending years, right, trying to get through the program, um, as it is for most that are trying to finish their PhD. And it, without faith, you know, I simply, I simply wouldn't have finished. And I think that, uh, you know, if we're, look, if we're looking at faith and relationship with sport commitment or things with commitment, it's a really important piece that's not being discussed or touched. And I think it's because people, they see the word Christian and maybe they, they steer clear, right? Especially from the institution I came from, Michigan State University. It's an R1 institution. You can't talk about faith in, in uh, your classes. And so I think that's a big reason nobody has, has tried to take on that um, uh, area of research. But I know it's critical. So it's one of those things that's really, it's, it's something for me, I think that being a, an instructor here at Hope College, my personal experiences with faith, I know it's a critical, it plays a critical role, and I just want to be able to explore it in some way to see if there's links. Um, but also just on a personal side, I know that it's important for our athletes to, um, to be faithful, and I think it can go a really long way for them, uh, even beyond the sport context, right? The sport context is important for them in the time, right? They all want to be uh, great athletes and whatnot, but can we talk about the whole person? I think faith can help. Uh, us discuss that a little bit more. So. Well, Femi, let me say again, thank you for going first. This is our first continuum <laughs> presentation since the pandemic began, so he's getting us started back again. He's going first for this cohort. Again, Femi, your work, uh, your thoughtfulness in how you do it, um, getting uh, your voice into our kinesiology department <laughs> in the mix. I love seeing our kinesiology department yeah. stretch out some awesome. research muscles today. <laughs> Even Dean Vanderstoop getting some disciplinary <laughs> stuff going. It was awesome. So thank you. Let's all thank Femi again, please. Thank you very much.